I remember being a kid when the movie Black Hawk Down came out, and it really banged then. And let me tell you, that movie still bangs now. Hello everyone, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense, and we are back with another edition of Tutelage in Blood. And today's battle is the Battle of Mogadishu, uh, also known as the Black Hawk Down Incident, or maybe better known as the Black Hawk Down Incident. I have reviewed the book uh, Black Hawk Down by Mark Bowden on this channel in my book review series. Uh, highly recommend that book for more information on the battle. As far as I know, it is the most comprehensive uh, documentation of that battle to date. So would highly recommend that, checking that out if you are interested in learning more about this battle. There's also a, a very good two-part YouTube uh, series that I will link below that basically, from what I can tell, just goes through the book uh, and explains this battle because, as always, we won't be able to dive into the deep uh, historical implications of the battle and all the details. We're just going to give a brief overview of the battle so that we can then learn some lessons. So if you're interested in a more in-depth take on the battle, please click that link, please read the book. This incident happened in 1993 in Somalia, so about 30 years ago. So a lot of it's recognizable and some things obviously are lessons that we have learned and some things are lessons that we should learn. So let's go through the battle and then we'll learn some lessons. The basic mission and setup for this battle was that they were going to drop in uh, some rangers to secure the four corners of this building. This is the target building. And then they were gonna send in the Army Delta teams in order to go in there and nab some high value targets, right? So they're gonna send the D-boys in to clear the rooms. Rangers are gonna hold security outside. They're gonna get the bad guys. Then they will have a convoy that will leave the HQ at the same time. This is all a city. By the way, I didn't draw the blocks, but that's what this is, is a city. Convoy will leave, convoy will park outside, they'll load all of the uh, high value targets and everybody else that they arrested in the building onto the trucks, and then they'll drive home. That was the basic plan. So, uh, all the helicopters take off, they all go to the target building. Uh, the Rangers, three out of the four Blackhawks get dropped off in the right corners. The fourth Blackhawk ends up getting dropped off like a block high, a block or two high. And Private Blackburn, one of the uh, soldiers that was in the Ranger chalk that was getting dropped off, he ends up falling from the helicopter for whatever reason. Uh, he actually survives, surprisingly, it was a 60 foot fall, but he survives, so they have a casualty right off the bat. All in all, the actual mission part of doing what they wanted goes pretty well. Uh, the Delta boys get in, they arrest the high value targets, the convoy shows up, they get all the guys loaded onto the convoy, they send the convoy out of there. The problem comes when bad things start happening. So Cliff Wilcott is the first Blackhawk uh, to be shot down. He ends up taking an RPG in the tail rotor. Long story short, he crashes about uh, 10 ish, 12 ish blocks, something like somewhere between six and 12 blocks. It's not that far from the target building over here. So of course they're like, oh crap. They send a bunch of the Rangers over here on foot. The rest they load into the convoy because they're gonna drive over to the crash site. Everybody starts moving to the crash site. Meanwhile, there is a second helicopter, Mr. Mike Durant, that ends up getting shot down over here. Uh, there are no forces to end up go to, going to the second crash site. So let's just cover that quickly. Long story short, what happens at the second crash site is there are no uh, resources to be able to go and, and QRF to quick response force, right, for that crash site because everything has been deployed to the first site. So after this crashes, Randy Sugart and Gary Gordon are two snipers that are on a helicopter circling that crash site. Uh, they end up volunteering, requesting multiple times to go down and protect the potential survivors. They get down there, uh, they end up giving their lives in defense of this. It's, it's an incredible last stand. Uh, it's a really, really cool story that we don't have time to go into. But these guys uh, end up dying. Mike Durant, the uh, pilot of that helicopter, ends up being captured and he ends up getting returned days later uh, after, the, after the battle is done. But that's really all that ever happens at the second crash site. By the time they get uh, to the total rescue mission for the whole battle, they get out here, Everything's already played out at that crash site. So at the first crash site, uh, there are people we, that we said that walked over and were able to get there. Everybody else got in the convoy. The convoy, long story short, ends up driving around trying to get directions from the helicopter. They're working through roadblocks, they're being shot at. They drive around for a couple hours getting really shot up and eventually are so ineffective they have to drive back to base to take care of their casualties, 
to reload up with ammo in order to try to get out of there again. So meanwhile, you end up with something like 100 Rangers and a couple teams of Delta guys, so maybe you know 150-ish guys total, that end up getting stranded uh, at this crash site overnight. And they're in different buildings uh, around the crash site trying to hold down overnight. Now, <clears throat> this was supposed to be a short duration mission, so as you probably know if you're at all familiar with this incident, a lot of guys took out their like plates, right? They called it their chicken plate, but like a plate that went in their vests at that time that made them uh, rifle proof, otherwise it was just kind of like a flak jacket. So guys had removed those plates, a lot of guys had not brought water or food or anything like that. Uh, so you know, guys are starting to get tired, hungry, thirsty, running out of bullets, the whole nine yards. Nobody brought their night vision equipment, of course, because this was a just a day mission, a quick in and out. So these guys are stranded overnight, uh, take several casualties, lots of people are injured. Uh, and it ends up that 19 Americans end up dying in this incident. Uh, Somali casualties are unknown, but they're high. We're probably talking in the thousands. Eventually, the, the US team is able to partner with their Pakistani partners in the area, get some armored personnel carriers. Uh, they plan a long route, and at about uh, 11 o'clock, midnight, something like that, they end up driving into the crash site. Uh, again, they stop at the second crash site, but there's nothing to be done there. They end up getting to the first crash site and then spend all night uh, working to cut out the, the survivors, or not the survivors, but the bodies of the fallen servicemen in the helicopter in order to get them loaded up and get out of there. So something like five, six o'clock the next morning, uh, they get everybody loaded onto the uh, armored personnel carriers and they drive back to the stadium. Uh, Apparently not everybody though, because about a dozen, dozen and a half guys ended up having to uh, run back to the APCs because they were forgotten initially. So they had to run like 10 or something blocks to get into the APCs and then they all drew, drove back to the stadium. This is also an interesting battle because Paul Howe, if you're familiar with him at all, uh, combat shooting and tactics, he has a school down in Texas, I believe. Uh, and he was actually in this battle. He was one of the Delta boys that was involved in this battle. And so if you read the book, it's interesting because he's, he's a semi-prominent character that comes up somewhat. And, uh, you know, he's, he's still alive, still with us today, and he's still teaching people how to shoot guns very effectively. So that is the broad strokes of the battle. Uh, again, if you want more detail, please watch the videos below. It gives you a much more play-by-play -play and blow-by-blow -blow, uh, iteration of the battle. However, let's learn some lessons from this battle. As always, I'm sure there are more and or other lessons from this. However, this is the list that I was able to come up with. And because this is a more recent battle, I've got quite a few of them. So I'll try to keep this as short as I can. Uh, the first lesson is sustainment kit and plates. Again, if you've seen the movie or if you're at all familiar with this, uh, one of the major things is that a lot of the guys didn't bring enough stuff, right? And I get it, as a soldier, you always gotta carry way more crap than you ever want or need. So if you have an opportunity to drop something, surely you're gonna take it. And a lot of the guys, again, they took out their, their plates for their full armor, out of their armor, uh, and they also didn't bring things like water or an emergency ration. And stuff like that matters. And this is a perfect example of why that matters. So even if your mission, your planned mission duration is 30 minutes, which that was the original planned mission duration, if that ends up expanding into 15 hours, if these guys would have brought a couple canteens and an emergency ration, they would have been sitting a lot better. Not to mention other stuff like night vision. Uh, Paul Howe is, is a good example. Uh, in the book, it talks about how Paul never not carried night vision again. He always had his night vision in his bag from then on throughout the rest of his career because if this ever happened again, he of course wanted to be set up for success. So there is certain sustainment gear that you should always have in your kit all the time. Uh, night vision included, water and food next. If you can carry more bullets, hey, that's always great, but Primarily the other stuff to be able to sustain you for that magic 8 to 12 hour time range so that if things go bad on your 30 minute mission, you're not sucking wind and rather you get to be an asset rather than a detractor. They had to end up flying uh, on one mission in during the middle of the night in order to just drop off ammo and water. Now of course they have to drop off ammo because you always need more ammo, right? Like <laughs> you can never have too many bullets in a fight. 
Uh, that being said, they had to drop off water too. So a lot of these guys are probably severely dehydrated. When you're tired and you're dehydrated and you've been fighting all day and you're scared, you're going to start making very bad decisions. So sustainment gear is more than just like, oh, I can tough it out. I don't need water for a while. It's less that. And it's more, you need to keep your mental faculties up as much as possible because you're in a high stress environment. And if you are actually hydrated and you have some food in you, you are able to think much clearer in a situation that requires thinking rather than not being able to do that. We have talked about it on this channel before, but you can go look at my patrol plate carrier setup and it would have been an ideal setup for something like this where you have a plate carrier and you have all the sustainment gear on it. So again, that if something goes bad, you're equipped to deal with that. The second lesson is expect a fight. Uh, this comes out more in the book and didn't really come out in our recap, but a lot of these guys are rangers, right? And rangers is other tier one operators. And a lot of these kids going in are 19, 20 years old. And it comes off in the book that they're very shocked to have found an actual fight. Uh, and it's the kind of a somewhat cliche thing of guys screaming in the middle of the night, oh, we're all gonna die, and people are freaking out because they're injured people and they're trapped now, and there's a lot of problems. And I'm not saying it's not a high stress situation, and I'm not saying I'd be behave or respond better. What I am saying is that a lot of these guys going in, particularly the Ranger kids, and I say kids because they're 19, 20, uh, and not the Delta teams who were much more experienced, had much more combat missions under their belt, and obviously have been in tough spots before, uh, they were freaking out that they had actually found a fight and now things weren't uh, unfairly weighted in their advantage. So you need to expect a fight. If you're going into a fight, you of course have to expect a fight. Now, they had been in multiple runs in uh, Mogadishu in the city before and they hadn't found a fight yet. And so this was the first time they really got their nose bloodied. And like I said, a lot of them just weren't ready for that. And because they weren't ready for that fight, it broke their OODA loop. And a lot of them got stuck in there and were unable to respond because they weren't prepared and they weren't mentally in the right headspace to have the right mindset to deal with an actual fight. Number three, have contingencies. And honestly, this is a part where the leadership does a pretty good job in this whole battle. Uh, they had a QRF force set aside in case something happened. So when that first crash happened, with Cliff Wilcott's crash happening, they were actually able to respond pretty well. They had a medical team to get in there right away. They had some extra support and some rangers to drop off right away. Like they had support in order to be able to get to and help that first crash site. What of course happened is they had a second crash which didn't help anything. Ended up four Blackhawks got shot down during this battle. Only two crashed. The other two were able to limp back to base, but there was a lot of problems and they just didn't have enough resources and contingencies to deal with it. Now, of course you can plan into eternity and you can always say, well, what if, and you should have. However, without Monday morning quarterbacking this too much, honestly, I think the leadership did a pretty good job during this battle of being calm, of having contingencies, of trying to work the contingencies the best they could given the circumstances. My point here is that you need to plan for when things go wrong and have a contingency and a backup plan. The next one is IFAC. So this is of course before we started issuing IFACs as normal parts of kit. And a lot of these guys didn't have IFACs. They maybe had a bandage, but nobody's carrying tourniquets. So we've of course corrected this and that's kind of general tactical knowledge now that of course you should carry an IFAC. But if you ever wonder, man, why am I carrying this thing? This battle is why, because a lot of these kids, again, are getting tagged and they don't have any immediate action medical in order to be able to take care of that problem. And they got to call in a medic or whatever. Carry an IFAC. I think we're at number five here, walk. So one of the lessons here is that when this initial crash happened, a lot of the guys at the target building could see the crash site, but several of them did walk over. The others did not. They got in the convoy because they were ordered to and they did what they were told. And then the convoy again got lost in the city for hours driving around. And imagine just driving around in a car, not knowing where you're going, getting shot at, and getting blown up for a couple hours. It's not a fun time for anybody. It would have been a better tactical decision for everybody to walk over to the crash site and have the convoy get back to base as soon as possible to drop off the captured uh, high value target. In an urban area, where vehicles can only go down certain paths, we call them streets, and then those paths start getting, uh, roadblocks start getting put up everywhere. It severely limits 
the ability of vehicles to move in urban areas. And you are much more mobile, ironically, on foot than you are in a vehicle. Vehicles, of course, are great for covering larger distances quickly. However, in this kind of environment, it would have been better initially if the whole team would have just been able to move on foot to the crash site and started to set up shop there. That would have got them there quicker, it would have required less casualties, and they would have been more mobile. So keep that in mind when you start thinking about urban environments. Next lesson, be brave. And be brave and go bag, these really go together because these are two lessons that we can take from Randy Sugart and Gary Gordon. Again, a phenomenal last stand that two guys observing the situation from the air, knowing that things are not gonna last at the second crash site, knowing that no one else can come help them, decide to get on the ground and fight for the lives of these remaining crew members. There are two lessons to learn from that. One is sometimes the chips are down and you just gotta be brave. And really that's what it comes down to with these two guys. They saw the situation, they knew it was a time to, to go all in and put it on the line, and they did. And because they pushed all their chips into the middle, they ended up paying with their lives. And they were able to save the life of the pilot. And had they not done that, the life of the pilot probably would not have been saved. So because these guys were able to be brave and make a bold call in the moment, they were able to save the life of an American service member. Additionally, one of the main problems that they had is they ran out of ammo. Uh, they got dropped off here. The helicopter was able to make some, some runs around them to keep the crowd off of them. Eventually that helicopter was running out of fuel and or ammo, I can't remember which, and that helicopter had to go back to base. And now it's just these two Delta operators on the ground trying to fight off this crowd. Eventually, again, they run out of ammo and that's what ends up costing them. It would have been a good idea for those guys, since they're gonna be based in a helicopter anyway, to have a big bag full of magazines and water and some medical that if the situation were to come up, they could grab and go, right? So if you're ever in any kind of situation like that where you're based out of a vehicle or a helicopter or whatever, and you think there might be a contingency when you would have to leave that vehicle to go do something, have a bag there that's specifically full of bullets and water and medical so that you can grab it on your way out and you're gonna be able to, again, sustain yourself and keep up a fight a lot longer than if you didn't have this bag. Next lesson is armor matters. So again, again, we talked about the lack of mobility of vehicles in an urban area. However, when those vehicles are armored, that of course is a helpful asset. The United States military had to end up borrowing armored personnel carriers from the Pakistanis in order to get on this rescue mission. Because of course those vehicles were armored, they were able to withstand things like uh, RPGs, which some of them bounced off, and they were also able to withstand uh, some AK rounds and all the small arms fire. Having armor on something like this makes a difference. And having your armor prepared and usable also makes a big difference. The Pakistanis were not aware of what the US forces were doing because the US forces didn't bother to inform them, which may or may not have been a good decision for operation security and all that kind of stuff. However, they eventually ended up needing that armor and because it wasn't prepared and it wasn't ready, it took a lot of time to get over there, to explain the situation, to put together a plan, to work through the language barrier, to get everything gassed up and then get out of there. You can imagine how much time that's gonna take. So having armor ready when you need it is also helpful. Making sure all your resources are prepared as much as you can, going back to the having contingencies, is gonna of course make a difference. Friction. Friction is a real thing in combat. Uh, it's also called the fog of war, right? You've heard that term. But I prefer the term friction, meaning things just don't work as well as they should. Uh, a perfect example of this is that convoy. So this convoy leaves because they're gonna get directions of the target building. And like I said, they end up having a route that's something like this. And then they go home. Where they drive by the crash site, this next line should be right here. They drive by the crash site about two different times because they are unable to find it and they keep getting directions over the radio and the helicopter's confused where they're at and they don't know where they're at and so they're told to turn left, they turn left, and they're like, no, 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 that's too late. You have to go back around and turn left again. And so there's just this, this chatter on the radio of trying to give directions uh, to this convoy that is, can't stop because they're being shot at, so they're constantly moving. And by the time they're getting directions, they're turning and it's too late. And there's this real friction part. The teams that can work through friction better are gonna have more success in combat than teams that cannot. And the larger a team is, in this case, we're talking about hundreds of guys in the US side, the more friction that's gonna be inherently in that system. 
you've experienced this because if you're just working with three people, it's pretty easy. If you all of a sudden start working with 25 people, well, now there's a lot more opinions and thoughts and there's more friction. So friction, of course, is multiplied when bullets start flying and bombs start exploding. Knowing that no matter what you do, friction will occur in combat. The best thing for you and your team to think for and practice and train for is how to work through the friction. Not necessarily to minimize the friction, although of course we want to do that, but we need to have the skills in order to work through the friction because we know it's going to happen no matter what. Unified command. On the ground at the crash site, you end up having several buildings. So the crash, I think, ends up happening in this alley. And there's a house here, and there's a building here, and there's a building here. The Delta boys, I think, ended up in this one, and you have Rangers down here in this one, and I think the QRF was somewhere in this building. The problem was they did not have unified command because the Rangers reported to Captain Steele, the Delta boys kind of had their own command structure, and then the QRF reported up to Captain Steele. So you had this somewhat of a little bit of a rivalry on the ground between the Delta boys and Captain Steele in charge of the Rangers because there wasn't a unified commander on the ground. So both of these units are radioing back to headquarters asking for instructions because there's no, again, there's no unified command on the ground. Having a unified command makes a big difference. When you get into the muck and the shooting starts, there needs to be one person who's making the decisions in order to move things along. Not multiple elements vying for command and control. That doesn't help anybody. Air power. We mentioned earlier that the United States ends up losing 19 service members who die in this battle, uh, and the Somali casualties are somewhere in the thousands. A major, major, major reason for that was because the United States had complete air supremacy. Uh, they were able to run their helicopters, both Black Hawks and uh, these littler birds, I don't know what they're called, uh, with mini guns and all kinds of armament against the crowds and the people that were trying to attack the Americans and kill people by the hundreds on these runs because they were able to just dump an excessive amount of ordnance onto the bad guys. Having air power makes a difference. And having air power is very effective when the other side does not have air power or any kind of anti-air capability. The battle plan on the Somali side, the battle plan was to shoot down some Blackhawks and collapse the city around them. And in that regard, they very much succeeded in that battle plan because they shot down four Blackhawks. Like we said, two crashed, but two made it back but they were able to really hamper the American supremacy. But because they were able to shoot down two of the Blackhawks, they were able to turn that air supremacy on its head a little bit by causing an issue for the Americans to now have to deal with and rescue these down Blackhawks. All that being said, of course, you would always choose air supremacy over not having it because when you look at the casualty numbers, it, it's completely lopsided. Uh, and that is entirely due to air power and being able to dump in an excessive amount of ordnance from the sky on bad guys. I had Murphy's Law up here, but it seems like we've already kind of hit that one, just in the sense that things are always gonna go wrong and you have to have contingencies to deal with it. You need to be prepared in the mindset and expect the fight and be planned for stuff to go wrong and plan for how you're gonna deal with it when it does, knowing that something is gonna go wrong because it's combat. And in combat, the bad guy always gets a vote. The last lesson is dangerous unarmed hostiles. One of the interesting and sad thing that comes out of this battle is that the uh, armed Somali militia use unarmed civilians as human shields uh, and they push them in front of them in crowds. I read about one account where a uh, Somali militiaman was laying in the prone, shooting Americans, and he had two kids, like five, six, 10 years old, whatever, sitting on his back while he was doing this because of course he thought he'd be less likely to be shot at. And there are also multiple instances of Americans deciding at some point, forget it, and they just start shooting everybody because there's a huge crowd coming towards you. Some of them are not armed, but there's bullets coming from that crowd at you. And of course they just say, forget it. They're all, they're all a threat to me personally. And so they start shooting. And I can actually understand where they're coming from in that regard. And you might want to judge them for the morality of that. We can have that discussion later. My point being, you have to have a plan for dealing with dangerous, unarmed 
civilians. I'm going to put that one in heavy quotes because whether they're combatants or not could be argued. What are you going to do and how are you going to deal with when people are start getting used as human shields? Or there's another account of a woman standing in the street and some guy uh, in the prone between her legs, shooting between her legs. And eventually she got shot because again, someone shooting at you, you're going to return fire at some point. In the modern era, as we have combat in urban areas, you are going to have more and more situations where it's murky between a unarmed civilian and a dangerous unarmed combatant. And how you treat them and how you draw that line is still open for debate. However, thinking about that and having a plan to deal with that is going to be helpful. So that was quite a few lessons. There are a lot more from this one because it's a more modern battle and there are many more details that we can relate to. I hope that was helpful. Do brave deeds and endure.